we are in Matthew chapter 5. Um, we are picking up things from verses 21. And as I told you last week that this, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, and 7, are such instructions from the Lord to us, his disciples. And we are going to study this very, very slowly. And I know that we can pick up speed after chapter 7. But this morning we pick up from chapter 21. Jesus giving us his disciples this sermon on the mount. He gives instructions on how we should live as his children, a higher life than everyone else around us. I don't know whether you see yourself living a higher life. Praise the Lord. Because we belong to a different kingdom. Let me pump this in your mind. The day you gave your life to Jesus, you belong to a different kingdom. You were delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, of the kingdom of God. And so what is acceptable in the world is not acceptable in the kingdom of God because these two kingdoms are not the same. Praise the Lord. I don't know whether you encourage yourself. Sometimes I need to encourage myself that I'm different. I am not of, the, of this world. I am in the world, but I'm not of the world. I am of the kingdom of God. I am a child of God. I have a higher standard of living. I have a higher standard of morality. I have a higher quality of life, a quality of love, a quality of understanding, a quality of wisdom. And in these chapters, we are going to see Jesus instructing us how we ought to live. We have the ability to live this higher life, not because of our own strength, but because of the Spirit of God that lives in us, and that what, that's what makes us different. Praise the Lord. And so, Jesus, being a great teacher, he simply lays down a proposition in chapters 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. He lays a proposition. What's a proposition? He lays a statement or an idea or a scheme and then illustrates it. This is key to all good teaching. Like Jesus is the greatest teacher who have existed. So in chapter 5 and 6 and 7, we see Jesus laying a statement or an idea or a scheme and then he illustrates it. Secondly, Jesus is dealing with, that, with the attitudes because it's not just the activity. It's not the activity that the, old, that the Old Testament is speaking about. It is the attitude that manifests themselves eventually in those activities that Jesus was concerned about. There were people in Jesus' days who had the message of John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist coming to the scene and he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. They had him. And then even when Jesus began his ministry in chapter 4 of Matthew, he came up and said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But there were those who were living during the time of Jesus. And they were saying, repent for what? We are really the righteous one. These men were called the Pharisees. They went around keeping the law in minute details. I told you last time, if they had teeth, if they had braces in their teeth during the Sabbath, they would remove them, lest carrying those braces would, would, would amount to work. And so they kept the law in minute details. So now, Jesus comes to the scene and he says, repent. And they are saying, repent of what? We are the righteous one. The word Pharisee actually means the separated ones. 
these guys kept the law. And during that time, the people of Israel had this saying, if anybody was to be in heaven, if there are two people only in heaven, it had to be a Pharisee and the teacher of the law. Because the people viewed them as the most righteous of all the people in Israel. And then as we, we, the last statement that we read last week, Jesus comes to the scene and he has all these, his disciples, he's called the apostles, and he says in verse 20, he says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not be in heaven. You will not enter heaven. This must be a very shocking statement to the Pharisees. And so, as Jesus comes to the scene and begins to explain the essentials of the law and what the Old Testament law actually means, and I believe that this morning, as we read these few verses today, that your heart might be warmed up to understand exactly the value that God has given given us. It is not the external manifestation of what happens from the outside. It is the heart that Jesus seeks for. He, he seeks to cleanse our hearts. He seeks to change our attitudes. Those hidden things in our lives, those are the things that he wants to get into our hearts and change us. The purpose of the, of the that is the purpose of the sermon on the mount. And one of the things that we see as we read through these verses is that the purpose of this sermon is to condemn you. You are a sinner like all of us. We are equally guilty because we need a savior. The sermon on the mount was meant to, dr to drive us to Jesus and to drive us to the cross of Jesus. The Pharisees and the scribes outwardly seem to be holy and pious, but inwardly were spiritually runts, like many of us. So as we go through this, we begin with murder this morning. In Exodus chapter 20 of the Ten Commandments, there is one called do not kill. But what did it exactly mean? Then we go to adultery. Do not commit adultery. But what does it really mean in the New Testament? And so Jesus begins to explain this to his disciples. Remember, he climbed on the side of the mountain and he sat down and taught his disciples. And now this morning we are picking from verse 21. He says, you, sh you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the cancer. But whoever says, you fool shall be in danger of the hellfire. He says, you've heard in Exodus chapter 20, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, in the Old Testament, you've heard in those days of old, you shall not murder. But he says, I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother, Okay? He talks about anger. If you're angry with your brother without a cause, you shall be in danger of the judgment. Here Jesus is saying it is not murder externally, but it is anger. Anger boiling up inside of you that will put you in danger. Danger begins when you become 
angry internally. You may disguise temporarily that it's okay. But if the anger is brewing inside of you, it will lead you to danger. Anger is one letter short of danger. Okay, look at the word anger. If you add D, it becomes what? Danger. Killing is not the outward act. It is the attitude brewing inside of you. Are you angry with someone this morning? The word raka there is an abuse. It is the word empty-headed or full of vain fellow. I remember when I used to work with a friend of mine, his name is Tony Handel. And when he wanted to describe somebody who, who, who doesn't comprehend quickly, he says that guy is airheaded. And I didn't understand for a very long time because it was an American slam. But if you say fool, which is a, even a stronger word than raka, raka means a fool. If you say fool, which is also the word idiot. If you say a fool, it means you are putting yourself in a worse condition at the time of judgment. The Pharisees would say, oh, oh we've never murdered. Okay, they were the righteous of Israel. We've never murdered anybody. But Jesus says, have you ever been angry towards a brother? Have you ever called anyone a fool? All this leads to danger eternally. Let us look at this a little bit. Can any of us, any of us be angry? Have you ever been angry? Yes. Have you ever been angry? And you actually say, I was angry at them. Oh, I was mad at them. Yes, we have all gotten angry. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26, Paul says, Be angry, yet do not sin. Don't be angry until the sun sets. That means that anybody can be angry over something. I have been angry over some issues. If I hear a child has been molested, okay? If I hear a woman has been beaten by her husband, I get angry. Some of you are saying, hmm, how come? I get angry. There is a place for righteous anger, right? I am mad at this person who has molested this child or this man who has battered this woman. I get angry. Jesus demonstrated that when he went to the temple, it was righteous anger. And he overturned all the tables of the money changers. We read that story. I, I know we are going to get that to that later. But when he came to the doves, where they were being sold, he said, take these birds out of here. John chapter 2 and verse 13. He was in control. He said, you know, take them out of here. He was in control. He did not lose his temper. Yes, there is a place for righteous anger. But if it carries on to the next day, then you are in danger. You need to deal with the anger. Sometimes people say, but how? I'm an angry person. Number one, you pray. When you get angry, immediately say, God, I'm angry. I'm angry. God, help me. Right? You pray. 
you wage spiritual warfare. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is taken by force. There is a place for us to get angry. Nobody can say, I have never gotten angry. But when we get angry, we wage war against spiritual forces of darkness. Ephesians 6 verse 13, Paul tells us, Therefore, take on the full arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. The evil day will come, and he says, having done all to stand. For we do not war against or wrestle against flesh and blood, but spiritual forces in dark places. Anger is in us. If I step on your foot right now, you know the reaction? <laughs> Why are you? Huh? Some of you will say, oh, which, which fool is this? Hmm. We react differently. Anger. There is so much places in the Bible which talk about anger. Anger is described as the act of the flesh. In Galatians 5, verses 20. Talking about corrupt desires in us. You see, also one day I was listening to people. They were praying. Let's open to Galatians 5, 20. Let me, let me read it for you. Galatians 5.20 Galatians 5.20 Let me begin from verse 19. He says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which is Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, envy, murder, okay, drunkardness, rivalries, and the like. We see right there outburst of wrath. It's an act of the flesh. It is in us. And a life that is dominated by the flesh, Paul says, this is the characteristic of that life. But then Paul again tells the Colossians in chapter 3 verses 8, but now you yourself are to put, put off this and the least, in that list, is the word anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Praise the Lord. So we see the word anger repeatedly talks about, talked about in the scripture. One, it is an act of the sinful nature together with hatred and sorcery and contention and adultery and fornication, selfish ambition and envy and murder, it's one of those acts of the sinful nature. Now, when we come to Christ and Jesus is in our lives, the Holy Spirit begins to do a work to change us from that old person that was dominated by the flesh and the works of the sinful nature into that person who is now led by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so now, Paul says, but now you yourself are to put off all this. And the list is anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, a filthy language. And by God's guidance, we are told to put off the things. You yourself, you recognize that this is my weakness, okay? You know there are people that you meet and any small thing, they are boiling up. You're saying, you think, who are, who are you? You think, who are you? They are folding their, their, their sleeves all the time. Brother, slow down. Slow down because 
we are to get rid of the things. And so, finally, in the area of anger, Ephesians 4, verse 31, the Bible says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Praise the Lord. Here the Bible says, let all bitterness, because once you develop anger and you keep in anger, very soon you get into bitterness. And bitterness, of course, is now the second stage, and now you're pregnant with bitterness. And what is the next thing? You plan to do harm. And here Jesus comes to the scene to these Pharisees who were all righteous Pharisees who had kept the law. You know, when Pharisees would walk, they would look down lest they would see a woman, all right, and sin. So the Pharisees would say, we have kept the law very well. We are okay, like all of us this morning. Praise the Lord. I see all okay people. Okay, but deep down, what is in there? And Jesus said, but I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother, okay, without a cause, you're angry with your brother, you're angry with your sister, shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, you fool, you airheaded, you right shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell's fire. Here we see evil speaking. We are talking about also about a filthy language. You see, remember we are of a different kingdom. Now, our language must begin to change. Later on we will see that we are supposed to bless even our enemies. We are supposed to pray for them. If you are a person who is always abusing, not, maybe not indirectly, not directly, you're always saying, ah, I met the other fool, I met the other stupid person, I met the other, hey, that's a full language. And the Bible says, get rid of it. So it is not the physical act of murder. You getting a panga, getting a stick, and then you slay somebody, and he dies. It is actually begins from in your heart. And here Jesus is saying, if you're angry with your brother, and you're maintaining that anger, you're not forgiving, you are actually a murderer. That's very hard. So, our anger, how do we maintain, how do we deal with anger? When you get angry with a person, you should be quick to prayerfully forgive. We're going to talk about forgiveness when you get to chapter 6. You are quick to forgive and release. And sometimes it's so painful that this anger holds in and makes you sick. And by the way, I've met people who have been so angry and bitter and they invited demons into their lives because they have failed to forgive. They are living in so much bitterness that they have given a foothold for demonic activity in their lives. Watch out for unrighteous anger where you are bitter, calling people idiots and fools. Jesus said that is equivalent to murder. And it's murder in two senses. One, when people are bitter and calling people names, do you know what they do? They go around gossiping, they slander, and character assassinate. So basically, you're killing the person's testimony, but you're also killing his personality. They will no longer be able to respond to people the way they once did because you killed them, because you, 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 you assassinated them. Their integrity, their character is in jeopardy. And so people begin to look at them differently. 
because you have been angry and you've said some things that are not right. And so Jesus says, if you say Raka, which is a fool really, you shall be in danger of the council. But if you say you fool, which means really airheaded, you have no brain, you're just uh, an empty skull, you are in danger of hell's fire. And so I think that it is something that we need to take to heart as believers. How do we control anger? How do we deal when we are disappointed? When we have been hurt? How do we deal with that situation? And let me recommend to you, the presence of God brings healing into your heart. He heals you from that heart. And then verses 24, it says, no, no, verse 23, continues to talk about our relationship with each other. He said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and you go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I think this is very interesting. Okay? Very, very interesting. So if while you are in the altar, what is the altar? A place of prayer, a place of praise, a place of worship. If you are in that place as you come to the presence of the Lord and you remember that your brother has something against you or you have something against them, get off your knees and go practically and get right with that individual and then come back and continue your sacrifice of praise, of prayer, and worship. Now, does that mean that you and me should be tracking every person that has something against us? No. The catch word, the key thing here, here is, if you are in the altar, and you remember, okay, when you are in the altar, because along my life, of 50 years plus, people have wronged me. Okay? And if I have to go back to the age of 10 and go, brother, you wronged me, I've forgiven you. You wronged me, I, I will spend my entire life doing that. So Jesus here says, when you bring your sacrifice, while you're there, in a place of worship, a place of praise, a place of, of prayer, and you remember and I believe that in that place, the Holy Spirit is going to remind you to go and get right with your brother. Therefore, it means that that has been guided by the Holy Spirit. That please, leave your sacrifice. It will be accepted. Your prayers, your worship, your praise, leave it there. But please go and make right with your brother and then you come back to that place of prayer and worship. So the thing is, there you remember, in the place of worship. When you're in the place of prayer, there is a place of prayer. The Lord speaks to your heart, and he says, hey, this guy has something against you. Go get it right. Then you must go as the Spirit leads you. This is so important for spiritual health. It's important for emotional health. It's important for freedom. Freedom of fellowship. Freedom of association. Freedom to interact with your brothers and your sister when we get things right. Even in a small church like this, we need to get things right. Should we have issues with our brothers and sisters? Because we have a different value system. We belong to a different kingdom, the kingdom of God. So the key here is when you are in the altar. You are in the altar, and there the Holy Spirit whispers to you, I want you to go talk over this area with your brother. Then you should be able to go and share with your brother and you come back because you would have obeyed the Lord and your prayers, your worship, and your praise will be acceptable 
before the Lord. Verse 25 says, agree with an adversary. Again, talking about relationship between us. Agree with the, the, your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary delivers you to the judge. The judge hands you over to the officer and you are thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Again, an interesting phrase. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Now, listen. In the day of Jesus, if the plaintiff, the person who is complaining, the person who has been aggrieved in the time of Jesus, he would be the one to track you and track you down. If I have an issue with Felix, I have to look for Felix until I get him. Maybe I'll get my brother James who is stronger than I to apprehend Felix. And you know how they take men. They hold by the belt. All right, we shall hold him in two sides and take him to the judge. It was your responsibility to track down your adversary and then take him to the judge. It wasn't the police or the army. Praise the Lord. So that understanding is very important. And now Jesus is saying, while you are on the way, because now he has caught you, all right, he's taking you to police, right? Talk with that person. Humble yourself and talk with that person who has apprehended you physically and forcibly before you get to the judge. And so, this was, this was very important because then you are able to make things right. Who knows what is going to happen? You could be imprisoned once you get to court and then you'll not be released until you've paid the last penny. This was the law. And how will you pay the last penny when you're in prison? You can imagine how much we struggle when our loved one is in prison. We collect money. We look for resources. We, we, we are looking to get them out because prison is not a desirable place for anyone. And here Jesus is saying, hey, when you have a problem with your brother, okay? Settle the things before he delivers you to the police in our case. When I have a problem with my brother or you have a problem with me, the words of Jesus is you go to your brother. You see, the problem is many of us have been found to be very difficult even when we know there is an opportunity for peace. And I think many of us have found this to be true at one point or another. When you had an opportunity to deal with a situation and you chose not because of pride, let him go to court. Who cares? Let him, oh, let him. Praise the Lord. You see that happening. Somebody, something is small, this person might be saying, I need my 20,000. And you say, ah, who cares? Go to police. I don't care. I know the police. It drags you there. How much do you spend to get out of police? 20,000. You spend hundreds of thousands to pay yourself out. Praise the Lord. And you can be in prison. And, and so Jesus' idea here is, is that if we have issues with our brothers, in our sisters, we should learn to exercise humility and brokenness and settle these issues at home or in church or in places. Coming two weeks, we'll be talking about taking your brother to court. Jesus says, be wise. Be wise and avoid that. When you are on the way, this guy is taking you and you're talking to him, you have the opportunity be humble. Real practical stuff. Be humble. Settle the issue quickly other than going and wasting time in the court. Jesus said these are the issues. It's not just murdering someone physically. But have you been angry? 
Or have you not dealt with humility concerning those who have something against you or you have against them? This is real life. Anger. Sometimes anger leads us to fight physically and we've hurt people. There's a place to control our anger. And the value is don't let the sun go down. And when you're angry, pray that you don't sin and forgive. And then also, <clears throat> when we have people that we have issues with, it's good to settle these issues at home. Now Jesus switches the gear from talking about anger and relationships to adultery. I think we'll talk about this one as we conclude this morning. Verse 27 says, Have you heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery? And I'm sure the Pharisees were saying, Yeah, I have never committed adultery. Yeah, never. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Someone in the mount, one of the purpose of it is to drive us to Jesus. We are all guilty. If you are a superman, you could have been Jesus. If you've never looked at a woman lustfully in your heart, you're a superman. Or you're a superwoman if you have not looked. It's either way. Uh, some women are saying, yeah, those men are, are weird. See, the Bible is talking about them. Even women. Even women. You can look at a man and say, ah, I wish that one was mine. Oh, I wish. And so, the Pharisees would say, hey, great. We don't. We haven't. We wouldn't. We don't even look at ladies. We look down. Remember, these guys had bruises because when they are walking in the street, they are looking down. Lest they see a woman unseen. So they looked down, they bumped on walls, they bumped on trees. You know, these guys, you know, and Jesus comes and says, yes, you're looking down, you're not looking at people, but inside, inside, inside. It's the issue of the heart which Jesus is concerned about. Each of us, he wants to be the Lord of our hearts. He wants to give us clean hearts. And when we allow him to do that, he's able to change us from angry men and women, from men that last to clean hearts. Paul would tell Timothy to treat all the, sister, all the ladies, young women, as sisters with absolute purity. Absolute purity. We can relate with each other with absolute purity when God has done a work in our lives. And so, so he says, if you look at a woman lustfully, I have seen people physically with my eyes knocking poles, knocking trees, because a skimpy girl is passing and they go, feel like kicking the man. What are you looking at? The issue is not what we have done outwardly, but what is going in the heart internally. We are all guilty. Right? All guilty. The purpose is to drive us to Jesus. And secondly, the second purpose is when you read through the Sermon on the Mount, you will realize after you've known that I need a Savior, and you go through it again, you'll find that it's a standard for us and very practical to us. It's a standard. It's a standard against immorality in the church. It's a standard against fornication for the young people. It's a standard against adultery 
for the married people. Jesus gives us a standard. When you look at the other person, that you look at them with absolute purity. Because when lust begins to take over your heart, then you're going to be looking at everybody of opposite sex and desiring them. And my friend, you are in prison when it, that gets, when it gets there. Let me finish a few more things. Verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you than one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into, into hell. So, Simon on the Mount. We see Jesus now saying, you got to deal violently with anything that is causing this kind of tendencies in us. Deal with them violently. Now, from time to time, I've heard people that are plucked of their eye physically or who have chopped their hand physically. By the way, sometimes when you, when you go to those Arab nations, you see people without, without one hand, and you know this one was a thief, right? This one was a thief, and the penalty for a thief is chop the hand, which steals. But does that stop the man from stealing? He still has another hand, okay? You still have another hand, or you pluck off one eye, you still have the other eye, right? And if that one also is sinning, Okay, you then pluck that one off and chop off the other hand, and then what happens with you? Let me tell you, I've had a conversation with the blind people. Blind people who don't see. They have a very high intelligence. They hear voices of people. And one of them said to me, my main problem is lust. So is plucking the eye what Jesus said? No. Because even if you pluck your two eyes inside your heart, you will still do what? Last. It's not plucking the eye. I've had people who have poked their eyes out and chopped off their hands. Jesus is not talking about physically poking off your hand, off your eye, or chopping your hands off. He's saying, deal with these tendencies very violently and directly. If it is part of your, your hobbies, okay? If it is part of your being, or if it is part of your activities, which is leading you to this kind of thing, which is destructive, deal with it violently. Pray to the Lord to give you a clean heart, and then you are able to look at people with the holiness because we are not going to look down like Pharisees to not see. So Jesus here says, chop it off. Deal with it. If it is your hand which is always grabbing things and reaching for people's chicken and cassava and granites and all the things, deal with it. And how do we deal with it? We come before the Lord for help. We need a help. And God has provided help for us by the working of the Holy Spirit to change us from glory to glory to glory if you allow him. You will find a man who has been very ruthless and harsh and angry changed to be a kind man. You will find a man who has lived in lust all his life, who has been very adulterous, God is able to change us if we give him the opportunity. And so Jesus here is basically saying, deal with those issues very violently in your life. Go violently in prayer. And sometimes some of this take time in fasting. Praise the Lord. I will not continue with divorce and oath and all this. We'll talk about them next week. But I wanted us to just look at some of these issues that Jesus is talking about. Look at anger. How is it in your heart? Maybe this morning you're angry. 
against your brother, against your mother, against your sister. And Jesus says, this is murder. Maybe your mouth is really bad and you're calling people all the time, you're calling people fools, that, those stupid people, those idiots, those... And Jesus says, you are character killing them. And he says, you know, deal with it. Ask God to help you in the area of anger. Anger is one of those acts of the flesh. And we are reminded to get rid of them. Maybe some of us are having problems with lust. We met people at last. And we ask God to help us. Help us. Help my eyes. Help my hands. That I may use them for godly things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You look at us. And Jesus, I know you. You know our weakness. You know where we need help. You know where we need deliverance. Give us clean hearts. Give us clean hands. Give us clean eyes. Help us to walk in purity, to walk in holiness, and to be faithful to our brothers and sisters. Lord, as we talk about lust, talk about anger, all of us are guilty. But by your blood, we've been cleansed. And I pray that, Lord, you will help us to deal with the things in our lives. To put them off, to get rid of them like your word encourages us that we may be released to walk in freedom as we serve one another. As we relate to one another that, Lord, there will be no hint of the things in our lives. Even when we have righteous anger against the injustice around us, Lord, help us to forgive. Help us to forgive one another this morning. Maybe there is strife among us. A sister and a brother. Lord, give us courage to talk about these issues and that you might heal our brokenness. That you might heal the wounds that we have. Heal us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's all stand up as we sing this last song.